Uh, and, and again, they now say a magnet. Where's this force come from? Oh, it's virtual, virtual photons. What do you mean virtual photons? You might as well say, well, there's a little fairy dancing on it, and that fairy is catching it. There are no virtual photons. That, what, that's nonsense. You just, look, we know there's a force. Something is going on. I can feel it. This is a strong old magnet. It's crushing my fingers. But that is a free energy machine. This, if I put this on this side, it's going to fly off. How's it flying off? How's it giving this thing, how is it giving it energy? And it's never giving, it's never stopping. It's permanent energy coming out of here. What are you talking about no free energy? Look at that. So you've been told a fantasy. You've been told the fact there's no free energy is impossible. Look, what's that? <laughs> of course it's free energy. So this is real science. I'm trying to tell you what is reality. Uh, and you have to let go of the fantasy that you've been told. Hi there, my name is Toby and this is Body Efficiency Training. On this channel I talk about body dynamics and chi energy, and in particular the science of chi energy. And that's what this, this lecture is all about. This is lecture number three in my Magical Science lecture series. And in this lecture I'm talking about the formation of the universe. You see, this is all about Tesla's science. This is about the science of the ether. And the ether is the chi, at least in the way I'm explaining this. So this science, I'm calling it magical because it involves both an experience and a knowledge and understanding. We need to understand it, but also feel it. So magic is really a feeling, and I mean real magic. That's why I'm using a K. So this is like the old fashioned magic, a mystical magic. It's not about trickery, it's about feeling, it's about energy. And we all love this feeling, we love it. When we get this feeling of magic, it's very special. We, we, and if you get it, enjoy it and make the most of it. And most, make the most of it, we need more of this feeling. Uh, lecture one, I was talking about how modern science is very unsatisfactory and what we've got in quantum mechanics is very convoluted and very unnecessary and it's based on some false assumptions. And in lecture two, I was talking about the force. What is the force? What is the ether? What is the chi? And this lecture now, once we've got those two things out of the way, we can now talk about the universe. How does the universe form? What is the formation of the universe? It's not so much the creation of the universe, it doesn't begin, but what we've got is formed in a certain way. It's continually forming itself. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Tesla's model of the universe is fluid. It's analog. It's, it's the field, it's field theory. Quantum mechanics has made a digital universe. Everything is separated, we have particles. And these particles are, are separated pieces of matter, which we, we haven't, and they haven't said what matter is. So you've made an assumption that there's a thing called matter, and this matter has, is, forms as, as a particle somehow. But they're not saying how this happens or what this is even. So let's start by drawing the universe. This is what we're going to do. We're going to draw the universe. But before we go there, I have a model of the universe here with me. And this is it here, a very convenient little model of the universe. And this, of course, is a shell. You can see this, it's a seashell. But I talked about this in the last, in the last lecture. This, the formation of this shell is governed by the mathematics of the golden ratio. There's this thing called the golden ratio. And it's a, it's a particular mathematical solution that allows growth to happen. It allows a continual repetitive growth to happen over and over and over in a continually expanding fashion but never in the same way it can in other words when you see it let me draw this once more when you have a flower the petals repeat over and over and over and over but what happens is as they keep repeating keep repeating it's got to always repeat in the gap between the other petals so it's repeating forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever but never in the same place and eventually you get so many that it becomes a circle. So this, is an, this is already is essentially a map of the universe. This already is that, because the universe is governed by mathematics, and the formation of a universe that allows us all to have a shared experience needs a particular mathematical solution, and that solution is phi. 
Let's draw it like that properly. Phi, the golden ratio. Now, that, that golden ratio solution is here represented in a slightly different way in three dimensions. So this you can see here is the formation of space. The formation of space. We start here at the tip. There's nothing. This is infinitesimally small. At the tip of this spiral, there is no space, there is no time. And then you look at the end of the spiral here, now we've got space and we've got time. Things are going on. So this is the formation of space, but space appears from nowhere, outside space and time. And from this, space and time is created out to here. So we've got to let go of the idea that there is a thing called space and time, and then the universe starts in it. No, no, time itself starts here. There is no time. So let's do, let's, let me draw this in another way. So, the ether, what is it? Let's remind ourselves what the ether is. The ether, or the chi, is pure potentiality, non-physical. We've got to start off with the idea there's something non-physical. Now, it does not mean it's not real. It is real, but it is not physical. It is non-Cartesian. Non-Cartesian. This is the best way of describing this. Non-Cartesian. So for those who don't know, Cartesian coordinates is simply an X, Y, Z axis. So this is an axis. These are Cartesian co coordinates. And you put a spot anywhere in here, and then you can work out where this spot is in, uh, in, car in space, in three-dimensional space. So Cartesian value, you can really say, is just three-dimensional space. And then non-Cartesian, Non-Cartesian is, of course, outside space. It has no, it has no position in three-dimensional space. So non-Cartesian, and then you have Cartesian, which is space, three-dimensional. We could also call this, let's call this space-time, okay? To use the quantum and the Einstein uh, language, space-time. We've got, again, let's, let's quickly digress, because this is three dimensions, and now we're saying that time is the fourth dimension. Well, th this whole idea is nonsense. We've got to let go of this idea. There is only, let's not talk about dimensions. There is only here non-dimensionality. So there's, there, okay, there's something called dimensionality. This is the best way, dimensionality. And Ken Wheeler, again, I'll leave the links below, he, this is his idea. He talks about this. He says there's dimensionality and there's non-dimensionality. So there's only two things. You see, if you talk about three-dimensional space, Cartesian value, well, you say, oh, I draw a line, that's one dimension. Then I draw another line, that's two dimensions. And then I draw another line, that's three dimensions. Yeah, okay, I can see what you're saying here, but when you draw one line, that, that's the same. It's, it's just said over and over. You've just got the idea that there is some space here. So this is dimensionality. Now, if you can't draw anything, non-dimensionality, well, you can't draw it. But non-dimensionality, you might you have to draw it as a dot. But it's not a dot, because a dot will appear in dimensionality. So it's an infinitesimally small dot. It's so small, it's smaller, 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 smaller. It's infinitesimally small, so we can't draw it. It's outside Cartesian coordinates. <laughs> But interesting enough, if you expand Cartesian coordinates off to infinity, so when you expand to infinity, how do you draw infinity? Well, you'll have to draw it as a circle. It would be an equal expansion away from the dot, wouldn't it? It would be an in equal expansion in all directions off to infinity. But how do you draw that? Well, you'll have to draw it as a circle. But of course, you can't draw it as a circle because it's gone off to infinity. So it's again, infinity is also reaching away from Cartesian coordinates. So as you approach zero, which is infinitesimal, or as you approach infinity, you're moving between dimensionality and non-dimensionality. So the ether will exist as zero, and it will exist as infinity, and dimensionality will exist anywhere in between those two things, in Cartesian coordinates somewhere in three dimensions. But three dimensions is just dimensionality. And then to say time is a dimension is a meaningless statement. Time is not anything. Time is just a measure of change. It's got nothing to do with dimensions. You see, now in quantum mechanics, we've got 11 dimensions. 
11 dimensions as the last time I, I looked into it. But it's nonsense. I'm not even bothered to look into this anymore. The reason they keep adding on dimensions is to make the mathematics work. This is a mathematical construct, a dimension. And then we translate it to the lay person and we think, oh, another dimension. What's happening there? No, no, no. It, it's a mathematical construct. Uh, we don't understand what that means. The mathematics is very, very difficult. But the problem is the mathematics is based on a false assumption. The mathematics is true, mathematics is infallible, but you've got to base it on an assumption. You have based it on a false assumption and then you're trying to make it work. So you get more and more and more complex mathematics, but it will never work. And they add on another dimension. Oh, now it might work. And on. So this is really just a construct of, of quantum mechanics and we can forget all about that. This science is much simpler. You see, you, you've got, you, you, you're starting to create fairy tales now. Eleven dimensions is a, just another fairy tale. It's meaningless. So there's only dimensionality and non-dimensionality. The ether exists in non-dimensionality, zero and infinity, outside Cartesian coordinates. It has no Cartesian value. And then the real world, the physical world that we live in, has got a Cartesian value. You can call it space-time and you can call it dimensionality. So at the very, at the very, if you want to keep dimensions, we probably will come back to it all the time. Three dimensions. That's all you need to say. Three dimensions. So three-dimensional space-time. That's good enough. But it's really just dimensionality. So now we know that, but it gives us a reference point to start drawing the universe because we've got to draw it now. I'm going to draw a picture, and it is simple. It is very, very simple, but it's hard to get your head around it. It's very hard to get your head around how does something non-physical outside Cartesian coordinates become physical. And the only way it can become physical is through the golden ratio mathematics. There is only one solution to create this world, and it's based on the, on the, on the golden ratio. Oh, well, let me digress. Let's, before we draw it, let me, let me tell you how simple my mathematics is. So this is my mathematics, okay? I, I lay claim to this formula. This is my formula. So I, Toby Jacobs, this is the first time I'm ever writing down my formula for the grand unified field theory. All right, here it is. That's it. <laughs> now, how simple is that? Phi. That's my, that is my formula. That is my grand unified field theory. Everything in the universe is governed by phi. It's the most important number in existence. It, well, it is the most important number, flat out. It's the most important mathematical statement, mathematical symbol, phi. That is the real grand unified the field theory as discovered by me. <laughs> now, most of you, when you talk about the most important equation, of course, it's going to be this, isn't it? E is equal to mc squared. And that's quite simple. We can all remember that. But that's much simpler. Now, and again, E equals mc squared is it, sort of correct, but we haven't defined E, we haven't defined M, and we haven't even defined C. We haven't even defined what the speed of light is, because light does not have a speed. Light is not traveling anywhere. Light is a vibration in the ether. The ether is moving. Light is not traveling, there's nothing traveling, it's disturbing the ether. So there is no speed of light. And Ken Wheeler will talk all about this, but the speed of light is really the rate of induction of the medium. Or it's the, it's the hysteresis of the ether. It is the, the resistance of the ether against itself. So, and because there is a slight delay between the dielectric and the magnetic, this slight delay in the field coming into existence, this slight delay is governed by phi, but this slight delay creates space-time, and this slight delay also creates the ether, or the hysteresis of the ether, which will give you the speed of light, C. But it's not a speed, because light is not traveling anywhere, and light is not what they say it is. Mass, mass, mass is not what they say it is, because they haven't said, well, they haven't said what it is, but re really what they're saying here is energy and matter are the same thing, which I do agree with. You see, matter is just high-energy light. Light is low-energy matter. So anyway, we'll come back to that. But the point being is, everyone knows e, e, equals m, e equals mc squared, it's simple. Well, that's even more simple. And I'll give you one more. So this is Ken Wheeler's, this is Ken Wheeler's uh, grand unified field theory. So this is slightly more detailed. And Ken Wheeler has discovered this one, which is 1 over 5 to the power negative 3. 
And this one describes a little bit more than mine. This one is descri describing the relationship between the unmanifest and the manifest. So one, one is the fires, fires to one, but one is like the uh, pure potentiality, infinite perfection of the ether, and fire is like the, the imperfect uh, um, manifested physical world. But these two things interplay together, and this, this is a statement. It's not even an equation, it's a statement. So this mathematical statement is, is the grand unified field theory, uh, a la Ken Wheeler. Again, I'll leave the links below. And interestingly enough, this works out to be a number, and the number is 4.2 something, 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 an irrational number. And this, um, this amuses me because if you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the number 42 is in that movie, that film, that book. 42, they had, the, they had a joke in there that they remembered the answer to the universe, but they couldn't remember the question. And the answer to the universe was 42 but they couldn't remember what the question is. Well, here you go. <laughs> the, that's the question. But mine is the simplest. So mine is even simpler. This one requires a bit more explanation and a bit more mathematics, but this mathematics comes from Pythagoras. It's Pythagorean mathematics. Let's get rid of that now. So grand unified field theory is phi, the golden ratio. It governs everything. And this here is a three-dimensional map of the universe, but I'm going to draw it now for you. Let's draw it on the board. So... If we have a position of non-dimensionality outside Cartesian coordinates, so it's an infinitesimal spot, and we can't draw it, so I'll draw, start off with a dot here. Now, the question is this. Remember, th this is the ether. This is inertia, pure potentiality. Consciousness. Consciousness is outside Cartesian coordinates. It's, got, it's not outside space-time. But what is consciousness? Consciousness itself is pure potential. You can imagine all sorts of any old thing, absolutely anything, you can imagine infinite things. But that doesn't mean it comes into reality. So consciousness is pure potentiality. This is the ether, this is the chi. How does this come out into three-dimensional space? Well, again, we've got to look at mathematics. And we've got to look at the efficiency of mathematics. You see, the golden ratio is the only efficient mathematics that can make this happen. Well, it's the only one. It is the only, th and that is efficiency, the best. But look, okay, take a step back. The most efficient way, the most efficient mathematics of producing space, space and time, from nowhere, is going to be a vector, a line. And it's going to be a singular divergent line. It's going to move out in one way as a line. And to create three dimensions, so let's, here we go, let's say we've got, here we've got the Cartesian coordinates, x, uh, y, or I'll do it this way, z. These are Cartesian coordinates. And the point is somewhere in Cartesian space. But if you draw a line out, okay, a straight line is going to go off in one direction, but we want to create all space-time. What we need, actually, is a curved line. It's got to come out in a curve. And it's got to keep curving round and round and round and round and round and round and expanding like this. So this drawing, all we have to do to create all of space-time or Cartesian coordinates is to create a singular vector that expands outwards in this curved linear fashion, an ever-expanding spiral. And this will go off to infinity, round and round and round which means you have created all of space and time just with this one line. That's all you have to do. So this one geometric line creates all dimensionality. So this is quite literally how the universe starts. This is it. It's, it starts off as a line. But what is that a line? That line now is the creation, it is the transformation of ether. This is the transformation of ether into electromagnetism. Let's call it electromagnetism. So the ether comes out of the point, and as it comes out, it's becoming electromagnetism. So now, the thing is, this singular curved linear line creates all of space-time. That's all we need. And again, it's hard to wrap your head around it. But this is a vortex appearing from nowhere. A vortex, if I hold it up like this, you can see it's like a vortex going up, appearing from nowhere. This is, how the universe, this is how the universe is formed. Now the thing is, in the last lecture, if you go back, we talked about the division of inertia. So this is a point of inertia, a point of rest. 
And the moment we break this inertia, we come out, we've created a potential. And this potential still wants to return back to inertia. So there's another force. The moment this line appears, it's already sort of changed its mind. Oh, I wish I went back. It wants to go back straight away. It wants to go back straight away to inertia. There's a spring. It's like it's bouncing back. Now, because inertia has been divided, but it's divided. I've done it, I did it like this in the, in the last video here. Inertia divides into two. But this division is as a singular divergent line. And this, to be more specific, is a clockwise divergent line. Anyway, the moment this thing divides, it wants to come back again. So there's a spring back. And this line, as it diverges, we call that dielectricity. This is a dielectric divergence. So here we've got dielectricity, which implies a polarity. There's like a voltage difference. We've created a little bit of energy. But this voltage difference immediately wants to go back again. This line immediately wants to go back. And because this line wants to go back, this is the creation of the field. See, this is a divergence of the ether, but the divergence of the ether creates a force because it immediately wants to go back again. So this line now, now we have the electromagnetic force because the divergence is created by this dielectricity. Dielectricity diverges, creates a force, expanding away from the, the inertia in the ether, but immediately wants to go back. So now we've got a field, a force that is trying to pull this thing back again. So this is the two things, dielectricity and magnetism. These are the two things. And they appear with a slight delay. So this will appear first, this appears after. And there's a delay between these two things that creates time. You see, this, this is the initial moment. Uh, uh, divergence created out of the ether. And immediately after that, it's like, oh, I want to come back again. So you have two spirals. So you start here. This diverges out, and it's going to go out in this nice, this is called a Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci. 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 You can look this up. All this goes together with the golden ratio. The golden ratio, phi. Everything is phi. So this is important. This spiral is so important. This is it. This is the universe. This is the creation of space-time. But of course, at the same time, it's gone off to infinity, but because it wants to go back again, there's going to be also another one. There's going to be one coming from infinity, going, going, going back again. There's going to be another one going back again. So this is a, this essentially, this divergence is the dielectric field. And this convergence coming back in again is the magnetic, uh, sorry, this divergence is, is dielectricity. Okay, it's a dielectric um, potential. And then the field is the created by the, 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 the desire of this divergence to return back to inertia. And how does this create? Well, again, I talked about in the last one. It starts with desire. Desire. The ether, consciousness, has a desire. And that desire creates an impetus. That creates a movement. That creates a divergence. That creates space and time. It creates a potential, a limited potential of energy. This potential is limited. And this lim limited potential of energy always wants to come back again. It wants to return to entropy. And that here then becomes a magnetic field going back. So now you can see what we've got here. Now this already starts to look like a magnet. This is a magnet. And you've got, this is the point of inertia. There's the line of inertia. And there's also something here called the plane of inertia. So it's worth having a quick look at this. Because here we've got a map of the universe. This is the shape of it. And again, you'll have two. You can see one like this there, one like this there. But now you want to, ex let's, let's experience the force of it. So what I've got here is a magnet. And this is a very powerful magnet. It's so powerful, I've coated it in cardboard and then wrapped this tape around it to give a little bit of a space. Because it's very hard. If something gets stuck, it's quite hard to get it off. And I, what I've got here is another small magnet. But again, very powerful. And I've coated it in a little bit of cardboard again, <laughs> because if these two get stuck, it's very hard to get them off. Now, see, the magnet, the magnetic field is going to have this vortex, this spiral going on. And these, this spiral will connect, and, these two, and so it creates this sort of flower shape. But in the middle, right in the middle of this magnet, is the point of inertia, here. And this point of inertia is the point of chi, the point of ether. This is infinitesimal, outside of space-time. 
So in the center of this magnet, right in the middle here, there is a point of inertia infinitesimally small outside of space and time. It's, there's no space and time going on in this point. And then space and time will appear as the magnetic field appears around it. And it has a force, you see. Now, I talk about plus and minus. I haven't written it down there. But plus and minus. Okay, let me digress a tiny bit. You've got plus and minus. Sorry, plus and minus. This is charge. And you've got the north and the south pole of a magnet. Haven't you? Okay. Now, I, I've sort of used these two things, interchange them. They're really the same thing. These are really the same thing. This is the north and south of the magnet is, is, the, is that aspect when, represent, when reflecting magnetism. The charge is the same aspect when talking about di dielectricity. See, dielectricity here is a divergence. That creates a charge, but it's not really two different charges. It's charge and discharge. So it's having a charge and, and losing the charge. And when this thing comes back in magnetic, uh, when this thing is drawn back through magnetism, then we call it north and south pole. But really, this is the same thing. So let, let me show you here in the magnet. So you've got, uh, all right, so we have the north pole. First of all, let's find, so I've got to hold this. I'm holding this magnet flat so that it's going to face it always. I'm going to move it around the magnet. But I've got to hold it like this with my fingers so it don't fly away. So first of all, I've got to find where they, okay, now, oh, there you can see that. So that's the north and south pole attracting. You can hear that as a bash in my knuckles. It's got a, right, it's a strong force. This is quite heavy. So you can see how powerful that magnet is. So that is here, the vertical line. Okay, so the plus and the minus, the charge and the discharge are wanting to release. So they want to return back to inertia to try and become one. So they're pulled together. Now, if I turn the magnet around the other way, so now I've got the two poles two positive or two negative charges uh, resisting each other because they're both, they both want to do the same thing. So they don't, they're not going to attract each other. You see, it's a, 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 a opposites attract the similar repel because if they, they can't come together because they're both searching for the same thing. They're both trying to return to inertia. And this is the opposite direction of returning to inertia for them. You see, this is the correct direction. This is the opposite direction. So this is taking them, as I push these two things together, they're getting further and further away from inertia. So they're resisting it. They don't want to go back. And in fact, you can't. You cannot, you cannot push this down to touch it. You need a very powerful pressure machine to push this down. And even then you will never get to finally touch. The magnetic field, the repulsion is so powerful. The closer you get, the more powerful it gets. You can't push them together. And then interesting enough, in the middle, so if I take the side of the magnet here, so now if I move it up, it's pushed, it's pushed away. As I come down here, it's pulled in. So as I go up, it's pushed away. As I come down, it's pulled in. Halfway in the middle, this is a plane of inertia, it's neither being pulled up or pushed down. It's exactly in the plane of inertia. So the plane of inertia creates a disc around it. There's a disc around it. So this disc around it is, again, you can see that in the formation of galaxies. The reason that, that, that if you have a galaxy, let's do this now, again, we're, we're going to come to this, I'm going to start this again in a minute so you can see it all over again. But look, let's digress. Formation of galaxies, this shows you what a magnet is. Everything, everything follows this same pattern. So you have a point of inertia, a point of inertia gives you a vertical line, there's the magnetic field, okay, but of course it actually works in both ways. <laughs> you've got to think in, you, you've got to, you, it's difficult to visualize three dimensional space. It's hard enough to visualize this in three dimensional space, let alone talk about 11 dimensions. But look, okay, magnetic field, this is the line of inertia. Here's the point of inertia, and here's the plane of inertia. And this will create a disk around it. So this could be a planet here, and then here you have an orbit or spinning around it. It's not quite the same as an orbit. This is, this is to do with the electromagnetic field. The reason it will spin around in a disc is because if it goes up here, it's, it's either being drawn in that way, or if it goes down there, it'll be drawn in that way. Now, the reason it's drawn in both ways in gravity is slightly different. Again, we ought to come back to it. But look, just so you get an idea what this plane of inertia is, this plane creates a disc around the center, but you have this line, which is the center line, and then you have the center point, which is infinitesimally small. Small, outside here, there is no space and time. 
This is a non, this is non Cartesian value, it has no Cartesian value, it disappears. Unless this goes out to infinity, again, it's essentially coming back here again. But now you can see formation of galaxies, you can see uh, the formation of atoms, you can see the formation of a magnet. All the formations in the universe follow this sort of pattern, this particular type of thing here. So we have, we have a, a point of inertia, nothing there. And what happens is we have a clockwise divergent, a co clockwise divergent vector comes out, it's moving. And it comes out, goes around, but of course it goes all the way around and wants to come back in again. Okay, so you have at the same time, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, a convergent one coming back in the other way. So now the convergent one, let's see if I can do this. Oops. Comes out the other way. All right, <laughs> and goes back to a circle. So now what, what have you got there? Well, let's do that again. You can all recognize that. This is the yin and yang. This is the yin and yang. Let's do it another way. Let's do it another way. So here you have is the yin and yang. And you can look at this as another way. This is a wave. Here you can see a sine wave. So the sine wave, the formation of the electromagnetic field, but you also have a convergence and a divergence, a clockwise and an anti-clockwise. You've got everything in here, and in the middle here is the point of inertia. And if you look at this flat down, if you look at this, what I did before, looking downwards at it, then, of course, you're looking at this plane of inertia spinning around. This is like a galaxy going around the middle. And they discovered it now, all galaxies, you've got a supermassive black hole in the middle. So there's a point of inertia in the middle of all galaxies, and they're spinning around it. So a, a, what is a black hole? A black hole is simply a very large, well, it can't be large, but it is a point of inertia in the universe. It is right in the center of a black hole is an infinitesimal point that is a point of inertia. It's just a very big one. It's so big that the, the magnetic field itself is, is, is overpowered by this point of inertia. So everything gets sucked in. It's disappearing back to inertia in a black hole. But there's a point of inertia in the middle of this magnet. There is this black hole. There's a little black hole. It's just not as powerful as the one up in the universe. And in the middle of this magnet, there's another one. A little black hole in the middle of this. Point of inertia. It's just not as powerful as the black hole out in the universe. But they're all one and the same thing because this is a field. We, we're try, we've got to get out, out, out of our head the idea that they're objects. A black hole is not an object. A black hole is a sinkhole. A sinkhole in the field. Everything is sinking down into it. But anyway, here we go. The yin and the yang. And you can see you've got a movement. You can see this looks like a movement going round and round and round. There's a movement happening. So this represents the universe. Now this has been a bit, uh, you know, this of course everyone knows the yin and yang. But this is a real deal. This is actually the real deal. This is a map of the universe. And this appears in nature. It's very rare. But I'll, I'll leave a link below to another video where they're doing some very exciting technology. And it's called the thunderstorm generator. It's a new technology and it's basically based on two spheres, two metal spheres, and they pass gas through these spheres and they essentially are transmuting matter. They're changing carbon dioxide gas into other things. Now again, it is now having serious research. Real scientists are looking at this because of course that's crazy. How do you transmute matter? Well, they do it through something they call plasmoids. I'm going to talk about plasma later, but plasma is a state of matter where everything is in a flux. Nothing has really formed yet. And you can have these little ones called plasmoids, and they create it in water, tiny water bubbles, increase the pressure, increase the pressure, until we take tiny microscopic plasmoids, and inside that a dramatic thing happens, matter can reform. And they proved it. They've opened up the machine, and you can see all these different things. And when they look at this little plasmoid, when it transmutes matter, you can see it under the microscope, under the electron microscope, very small, in the, in the matter, it has this little yin-yang shape. And you have a little thing, a little lump on one side, where it's like we've expanded that way, and they have a little sinkhole on the other side, where matter has been sucked in, and the matter has popped out again, and it's been transmuted. It's very, very interesting, but you have to watch the video. I'll leave it below. Again, that's an aside, but what it means is the yin-yang symbol is the real deal. Remember, the ether, chi, it is mathematics itself. It is, it is geometry. It is symbolism. Me drawing this yin-yang, I draw it, and again, the Tao masters, all this was real to them. Their science was experiential. If they draw the yin-yang, 
See, let me draw it with power. They channel the chi, and when they draw the yin yang, let's see how I do it. <laughs> well, it's, it's nearly there. So look, that, have another go. Because when you draw the thing with power, you are trying, you are resonating. Let's try it another way. Well, that's an interesting one. There's a slight variation. So this might be, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if this, is, if this is the golden ratio that I've drawn it in. But what my point is, symbolism, geometry, drawing these magical symbols, this is activating the ether. This is activating the chi. When I draw that symbol, I am resonating my consciousness with the very universe itself, with the way the universe is formed. It's not about particles, it's about the whole big picture. Now we're going to come to particles because I've got to break this down and build it up. But the reason I've started with this general overall picture is they're all, it's all the same. This shell is just a shell. But this shell is copying the universe for a reason. It is copying the chi. It, it, it has to. There is only one mathematical solution in, for the life force to appear, and that's it. If the shell is doing it, the universe is doing it, everything is doing it, my body is doing it. Now, I don't look like a shell, but the growth of my body follows this same mathematical procedure. Everything does. And the field, the energy that comes out of this, this is a piece of energy. Now, think of it. We all say, oh, there's no free energy. If free energy is impossible, right. Riddle me this, Batman. This, oh, did you see that? Uh, moved it. Right. This itself is free energy. It, what, what is coming out of here? What is coming out of here? Energy is permanent. This is doing something permanently. I don't want to throw this, but the, 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 something is happening. Where, where does this force come from? Uh, the, <laughs> this is the simplest free energy machine you could possibly build. It's a magnet. Energy is permanently coming out of here. And it's more than that, energy is permanently coming out and is also permanently going back in again. The universe, this is the creation of the universe. This thing is literally the universe creating and destroying itself. One side the universe is diverging away and the other side it is, it's converging back in again. You have a clockwise divergence and a counterclockwise convergence. This, is, this itself is energy. What are you talking about? There's no free energy. That's it. I'll prove it. And I dare them to prove me otherwise. That They can't explain this. The only guy, the best guy to explain magnetism is this guy, Ken Wheeler. I'll, again, I'll leave the links below. So he's the guy that's done a lot of work on magnetism. And a lot of what I'm saying, I've learned from him. So I've got to give him credit. Let's look at this from a, 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 a small scale. So let's talk about particles. Right, so we know the ether, the chi, the force, inertia, starts at an infinitesimal point outside space and time, no Cartesian value. And it diverges away, and it will diverge in a clockwise spiral. Okay, logarithm, well, it's a Fibonacci spiral, again, governed by the golden ratio. The golden ratio is really the, the, the secret of everything in the universe. This happens on a very small scale. So this, this divergence of the field, okay, this will happen continuously. Okay, it's returning back as well, it's returning back as well, and it's happening continuously. So it creates a vibration. So this, this, this is a spiraling outwards vibration. Again, hard to visualize, but again, you've got to empty your mind and, and, think, and just sort of let it sink in and feel it. So you have a vibration that comes out, and this vibration can have different frequencies and it'll get faster and faster and faster, and at a certain frequency, this vibration is gonna create a standing wave. It creates a standing wave, a standing spherical wave. And the moment this happens, this is now self-sustaining. See, this wave is going off everywhere. This is all over the place. And, it's, and, and it can dissipate, it's going off to infinity. And when it goes off to infinity, of course, it means it's going back again. This one now is stuck. This is now a freestanding wave, a sphere, and this is a perfect sphere. And in the middle of the sphere, you're still going to have now its own little point of inertia. So now we've got a particle, but this particle, I'm defining it. This particle is, is, is a, a self-sustaining 
standing wave of the ether. So that's the definition of a particle, and that is also the definition of matter. All matter is made up of this one particle. So we've got one and only one particle because there's only one wave, there's only one, there's only one uh, ether, there's only one divergence, there's only one rhythm, one vibration, and there's only one solution to that one vibration that will create a standing wave. There's only one solution, so there's only one particle. This particle is the neutron. So this neutron, why has it got mass? It's got mass because this self-sustaining magnetic field, now it, 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 will, it won't let anything in. Nothing gets in. So you have another one. If you have another one, these two, these two can't meet. They can't get together. They're stopped by the magnetic field. And this gives you an effect. This is what I was showing you here. You see, when you're pushing them away, it can't get in. It can't get in. Okay, so this is matter. This is the formation of matter. Two, two, two neutrons, they can't, they can't get in. They, now, it can happen if you collide them. Something, you know, requires a massive amount of force. But what happens if they collide? All that happens is the wave breaks and the wave just go, goes back to, you've just destroyed the frequency. You've disturbed the frequency so that the energy can return back to inertia. Now, what's interesting is, it, the, the magnetic field has got a certain amount of strength and that certain amount of strength means they can't come together all by themselves. They need additional force. You have to collide them. But th this, this is enough force to build a structure. Okay, so now that means they can't get together again, but something will hold them together. Something's got to hold them together. Let's look at this. Okay, so we have a neutron. A neutron is a perfect standing wave. A spherical wave, a perfect sphere, and it, it has a, per, a certain amount of size, and because it's got a certain amount of size, that size is determined by the, the standing wave and the magnetic field. It's determined by that. That is the size of it. And then you, and, and that therefore is the mass of it. The mass is determined by the magnetic field. The, this, this sphere creates this effect of mass, and it's an effect of mass because it has a certain amount of resistance to another one. They can't get together. Now what's interesting is these two do want to go back together. Remember, the wave, the, 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 the vibration of the ether goes out, it wants to come back to ether. These two standing waves want to return. They want to return back to inertia. They want to go back to inertia. So in other words, they want to collide. They want to collide. If they collide, then they'll break and they can go back to inertia. They want to go back to inertia. So they are drawn together as well. They are drawn together because they want to go back. They want to disappear. And these two points of inertia want to become a single point. So you can already start seeing something like gravity going on here. But this is still, this is still just magnetism. Again, I'll talk about this. So if you have a neutron, a perfect standing wave, this neutron will also become a proton. It will become a proton. So these two things are the same. There is only one particle, so a neutron and a proton are two states of this one particle. You can't have any other particles. The reason you can't have any other particles is there's only one wave. There's only one, there's only one uh, distance to this wave. And therefore there's only one solution to the one, have a particle. And that's all going to be governed by phi. You can't have anything else. So there's only one particle. Everything else, okay, this is another digression. Everything else that we're looking at as particles, all different things. These are not particles. They, they may, ha may behave a bit like particles, but they're not. You, you've got constructive and destructive nodes. You have, you have the field like this, and when you have the field, interacting field, you have nodes, nodes of constructive interference, and you have nodes of destructive interference. So these will be nodes where, where matter appears to be, and these will be like sinkholes. This is where inertia is going back. These are inertial holes. So in these things, as the field is moving, these things will move. So these will appear like particles, but they're not. They're just interference patterns in the field. You will also get, and this is what they're looking at in CERN. What are they looking at in CERN? Because anyone in CERN, if I tell them there's only one particle, it's a neutron, they'll laugh. But in CERN, they're looking at particles, exotic particles, and they're going to keep finding them forever and ever and ever. Because you're, you're not... They're not looking at particles, they're looking at these interference patterns, and every time a collision happens, 
all sorts of energies coming out. It's always infinite variety of energy coming out. So every time they collide something, it's going to be different. Something different will happen and they'll go on forever. They're going to find exotic particles forevermore. They're never going to find one. They're going to find an infinite number. You see, and, and you still will have droplets of energy. You see, there's another thing. Let me just describe this to you. You know, you, you have a water. If you drop a rock into, into a pool of water, what happens? Well, first things first, the water goes down as the rock falls in. So the water goes down. And as the rock goes into the water, so the rock has now gone into the water, what happens is the water fills up around it and starts to rise up in response, doesn't it? It starts to rise up. As the rock goes down, now the water's rising up to fill the space. And what happens is, once you go up, once the water, there's a moment when the water goes up, 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 up like this, and the rock has gone down now, and the water's gone up, and the water goes up, 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 and then there's a little, the water then separates, a little bit of water separates up, and for a moment, you'll see it. If you watch this in slow motion camera, you'll see a little droplet of water form for a moment at the top there as the rock drops in. So now this is like a water particle. You'd say, oh, water has created a particle. But of course, that's not actually a particle of water. It, it, it is, it's a, water, it's a droplet of water, but you can't say that's a particle of water. It's a droplet of water created by this impact. It's created by an impact of the rock hitting the water. So this is what they're looking at in CERN, exotic particles. And depending on the size of the rock, you will have a different size droplet. So you're looking at CERN, they're just looking at interference nodes and they're looking at droplets of energy. And these behave a bit like particles, but they don't exist very long. You see, that's one of their complaints. Let me just show it to you. Look, in CERN, you have a collision. Two, they shoot the two particles together here and they collide. And these then around it has got some material. And what happens is the energy comes out and it hits this material. And when it hits this material, it, it, it's absorbed by it. So it will come out and it's traveling at a certain speed. It will be absorbed by the material and it will move like this, like this. And then another one will come out and go like that. Another one will go, oh, it's gone out. Another one might just, oh, I stopped. So they'll do all different things following the magnetic field or whatever's going on in this material. And because they know what this material is and because they know the impact, they can look at these lines and say, oh, well, that was a particle coming off and it has this properties because it went like that. But oh, then it ended, it, it finished. Where did it go? Where did it go? Well, it went back to inertia. You, you, just, you just created a droplet of energy that's gone back to inertia. And you could have all varieties of energy. So you're going to find these things forevermore. It's, it's, okay, I, I don't want to be too dismissive because they've discovered a lot of interesting things. But this is very primitive science. It's very primitive science. Look, you can have, look, you've got two monkeys. Here's a monkey sitting down. Okay, and this monkey here is throwing rocks. There's another monkey, right? He's throwing rocks. There's a rock. And there's another monkey over here. Right? And again, now he's throwing rocks. So we've got the science of two monkeys. Oh, that's meant to be his tail. Here's two monkeys throwing rocks together. That's what we're doing. So, and, and they're getting excited. Look, we threw two rocks here and we've got a spark. You, there's going to be a spark happening. Even with two rocks, you're going to get atomic things happening. Energy coming off here. You're going to get subatomic particles coming off here because they don't know that. And what, do that, what happens? Well, then you've got a rubble. Look, the two rocks broke up. And we've got small bits. And we've got some sand. And we've got a big bit. And then the monkeys come in and look at this. And they go, wow, look at that experiment. We've got big rocks, small rocks. Let's do it again. And we had a spark. And they do it again. And they have a different pile of rocks. They do it again. There's a different pile of rocks. This will go forever. There's always going to be a different pile of rocks at the bottom. They're always going to have a slightly different spark coming out. But, but just doing this over and over, they're not going to learn anything. This is not telling you anything about what rocks are. It's not telling you anything about what a spark is. So this is what we got in CERN. I'm, I'm, uh, apologies to anyone. Now, you should know I nearly did a PhD in theoretical physics. And I would have been working at CERN myself. So <laughs> I could have been there, but I didn't do it. Uh, I wanted to do theoretical physics, and that was just so competitive that um, didn't manage to do a, a PhD in theoretical phys physics. But I'm glad in a way I didn't because it le left me to think about this. 
it would have been a waste of time. I would have got my head lost in all that quantum mechanics and relativity. It's very complex, and I'm sorry to say, pointless mathematics. Pointless. You, you don't need it. So that was an aside, but nobody's looking at particles. They're looking at droplets of energy and interference nodes, a posit uh, a constructive nodes of interference. So we have a neutron. This is the only real particle. But we also know the neutron will decay to a proton. Every, every free-floating neutron eventually becomes a proton. It's about 17 minutes. They will always decay to a proton. So something happens between this and this. Now, I'm not entirely clear on my explanation of this yet, but I suspect this has just got perfect balance. The neutron is in perfect balance, and the proton is the same thing, but it's lost a little bit of its balance. Either it's been disturbed, or some of the energy is reduced, uh, uh, dissipated, and it's lost its balance, so it's moving a bit. Now, it's lost its balance, but it's lost its balance. What happens is the dielectric and the magnetic. Remember, the, remember this, this particle is the same as a magnetic field. Remember the map of the universe, it's all the same. Here we've got the dielectric. This is the, this is the vertical, the line of inertia. So this gives you the plus and the minus, or the north and the south of the magnet, same business. And then you've got the magnetic field. So in, in, in this perfect neutron, the, these two things are in perfect balance. It becomes a sphere, so it has no, it has no particular force. Nothing is, it's just, it's perfect balance. Here now we've lost a little bit of balance. So what happens is the magnetic and the dielectric are slightly separated, so we can see them. So now that means the dielectric is coming out a little bit. So now we've got, a, we've got a charge. So because of this, the dielectric and the magnetic are not quite in perfect balance. It's on a state of returning to inertia, but it's not enough to destroy the standing wave. It's still in the standing wave. What happens is this starts to attract things, okay? Energy can be attracted to it now because the dielectric, we now have got this north and south pole effect. Here we haven't got it. The no we have but the plus and the minus are inside the sphere. They're inside the sphere. Here the plus and the minus have gone outside the sphere. So something has happened to make this, to make this occur. Now because of this, we have the charge and it now requires some energy. So what happens is either this again could be disturbed and broken down, go back to energy and disappear. Or what happens is some energy comes to help and balance it. So it needs to be balanced, rebalanced. So then a proton is spinning like this. We've got, we've got the, now we've got a plus and a minus. But now we've got something happening and this now attracts some energy. Some energy is attracted to it. Again, for, I'm gonna use this plus and minus just because it's easy. So this, this spinning around is somehow now balanced with the energy. An external, a little bit more external energy around it. So this is the electron. This is what they call the electron. But it's not a particle. This is again not a particle. Even J.J. Thompson, the guy who discovered the electron, didn't want to say it was a particle. He didn't know it's not a particle. They forced him. He, he was hounded for years and years and years to say it was a particle. He didn't want to. No, it's not a particle. He just called it a unit of dielectric charge. It's the quantity. It's the quantity of dielectric charge or dielectricity it's a quantity of dielectricity required to balance a proton. That's all it is. It's not a particle in itself. See, this requires a particular quantity of energy to balance itself. And that's it. That particular quantity of energy we call an electron. But it's not a particle. It's a quantity of energy. And now, between the proton and the electron, now we have a much bigger circle. A much bigger thing. Now, this leads me to something else. There's two interesting sciences in the universe, and this is one of them is, okay, I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but there's two interesting things. There's resonance, resonance, and there's coherence. Oh, I've got to spell that right, coherence. Is it, uh, I might have spelled that wrong, but look, this is not important. Resonance and coherence. These are two very interesting things that modern science has difficulty explaining. Now this, what we've got here is coherence. In other words, once we've got the, the proton, which is really a neutron, a neutron that just requires to be rebalanced, and this neutron, or becoming a pro this proton is rebalanced by an electron, 
These two things now work together. These become a single unit. In other words, they have a coherence. And this is very, very interesting. When things get together, see so again, now, now we've got a proton and a, now we have hydrogen. Okay, this is hydrogen. So now we've got the first substance. And every other atom is, some, is just built up of a proton and a neutron, always built up of hydrogen. Um, so now this, this single atom is going to go back to behaving in the same way. This single atom now is going to behave in the same thing. A point of inertia in the middle is going to achieve rebalance. Though inside might be this going on, effectively it's rebalanced itself and it's come back to the same picture. It's always this. It's always this. In the atom is doing this. Everything is doing this. Okay, everything is doing this. So coherence is when all these separate things come together and they work together as if they were one thing all by themselves. One thing all by themselves. So we know a magnet. A magnet is a lump of metal. We have a north pole and a south pole. So we say it's got two poles. Something happening here, something happening there. But, but in the middle there's no, nothing. There's no magnetism in the middle. Now you could cut this magnet in half. What happens if you cut this magnet in half? Well, now that's still north, that's still south, and now the middle's here. Now, this is half this one, but they're now both the same thing. See, this one is all working in coherence, so now that becomes the middle. This one is working in coherence, that becomes... Let's do it again, we cut it even smaller. What happens? It's the same thing. We now just got a smaller magnet. Now we go, imagine you go all the way down, there's a few atoms, you've just got like a few atoms here, a few metal atoms, and we cut them in half. <laughs> it's the same business. In the, middle of the, in the middle of these atoms, there'll be a point of coherence. This little tiny chunk of metal. So the magnetic field emits from here. But let's go all the way down to one atom. One atom. Then we've gone all the way down to one atom. It's still the same. It's still the same. But now, would you call this one atom a magnet? Well, yes, you would. It's still a magnet. It's still the same thing. This one atom is doing this. This whole big magnet is doing the same thing and here is trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms well quadrillions but they all work in coherence as if this is one single unit now this is one big atom this is one big atom and this is one small atom but that's the smallest you can go because there's only one standing wave remember of the ether it's the size of the neutron there's no subatomic particles anything less than this We've just gone back to energy again. But what you can have is various different standing waves. You can have different frequencies. We'll come to that. But anyway, there's a coherence. So you've got to get this in the idea. And this is the same works with light. You can have a light source and all different light comes off it. But what happens when you have a laser? A laser, you have coherent light. It's all going off at exactly the same frequency. And a laser, uh, you see a 5 watt light bulb, and again Ken Wheeler talks all about this, a 5 watt light bulb, there's not much power comes off it, it's tiny, it's a, but a 5 watt laser, it burn your eyes out. It's the same quantity of light, but one is a laser and one is not. One is coherent and one is not. So co a coherency is multiplicative. When you, when you add on each one, each wave is coherent, it's in the same movement then it multiplies more and more and more power. But a laser is like one single, see, a, 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 a five watt light bulb, all different frequencies coming out. Every atom is doing something different. When it's coherent, it's as if all the atoms are doing the same thing. They're all releasing the exact same frequency at the exact same time. So this becomes like one giant atom releasing out one giant pulse of light in one frequency. It's coherent, coherency. So this is very important. These two things we're going to talk a lot about, resonance and coherency. And these are the secret to Qigong, how to build the Qi in your body. And these are the secrets to magical science, how to build new technology, all new alternative technology, wireless power is resonant. Using magnets, using lasers, this is coherence. And all, all future technology is going to be magnets, it's going to be lasers, it's going to be resonance. It's going to be all this stuff. So let's build up. We've still got to build up. So now we've got a neutron. A neutron is just a, a perfect balance. Then we've got a proton. A proton 
A proton is the same thing, but we've now got a dynamic happening. It's got some dynamic. And then we've got, then we've got hydrogen. So we have a proton with a dynamic, and that is uh, with a dynamic, and that is balanced by some energy to create an atom. So now we've got an atom, and this is hydrogen. But you can have more, you see. So this, this is a particular frequency. This, this is another particular frequency. This is another particular frequency. This whole thing will act as a single unit now. And this single unit will have a particular frequency all by itself. And you could break that frequency. If you break that frequency, it would disturb it and you could go back to this one. And this one, this one could also get knocked back to that one. But I'm not quite sure how that would happen. And this one, this one can be created... This one can be created directly from the ether. And this is, neutrons are created directly from the ether. You see, if you have a black hole, a black hole here is a point of inertia in the, in the ether. But from a black hole, there is emission happening. Not everything is getting sucked in. Things are getting sucked into the black hole, but things are also coming out. What is coming out of a black hole is neutrons. It, it's such a powerful point of inertia that it is, it is releasing high energy light so high that it's just releasing neutrons. And you can look into it. It's called galactic jets. And again, Ken Wheeler talks all about this. And that's Ken Wheeler's discovery. Ken Wheeler predicted this, that a black hole would emit neutrons, and it does. So again, that's Ken Wheeler's discovery. But a black hole is emitting neutrons. So neutrons are being created. Matter is being created out of black holes. So it's going on. So neutrons can appear out of the ether. These become a proton. This becomes an atom. But th you see, this can also happen. Once you've got this, you've now got a structure that helps balance. Because things are moving, you see, just being in perfect balance is very difficult. Just balancing is very difficult. But if you can move and move and move, this creates, an inert this creates a, a method of balancing. So this is more movement. This is like perfect balance. Now, how you could hold a neutron in perfect balance, if you let a neutron go in here, so you can have a proton here at an angle, spinning, then you might have a neutron next to it, so it's, it's, it's sort of in balance, and this electron spinning around. So this neutron is held in a particular balance because of the proton and the electron. So you, you can have a structure now that allows a neutron to stay as a neutron. A freestanding neutron doesn't stay as a neutron, it always decays to a proton. I think it's because this is too delicate a balance. It needs, it needs a structure around it. It needs a structure around it to hold this balance. So if it could get into a structure like this, with a proton and an electron, now the neutron can stay stable. So now this neutron is stabilized, maybe the proton is going around it. Something is going on here, but this is still essentially becomes, this is due to coherence, this now becomes the same thing. There'll be a point of inertia in the middle, there'll be a line of inertia, and there'll be a plane of inertia, and now you've got the same map. But all these three items are now working together in coherency to create another type of atom. So this is another type of atom, but it, 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 it still acts in the same way. It still becomes coherent. And then you can have more. Of course, you can have more. You build more and more. And now we get all different substances. All different substances, and they'll have different, different quantities of electrons. The reason we have different quantities of electrons is because now we're getting into more complex things. This, this level of complexity requires different levels of energy to balance it. So the number of electrons in an atom is simply determined by the, the frequency or what is required to balance the protons and neutrons inside it. And it, there'll, be various different, there'll be various different patterns. You see, you have a donut, and there's the, uh, the paraboloid and the donut. So these are the two things, the magnetic field, and this creates the circle. So when the paraboloid, when the paraboloid is dominant, then we've got this charge effect. And when the magnetic field is dominant, then it's like the charge effect that disappears and the magnetic field is complete around the outside. So once you've achieved the state of balance, you have this. But in this, you can have different, you can have different shapes, different fields appear, different patterns. These are cymatics. So the different frequencies will create different patterns in here, in this structure, and there'll only be certain ones. There'll be certain resonant frequencies that work with this structure. Certain frequencies have got to fit into this shape. 
And these different frequencies will have different numbers of, numbers of electrons. And that's why electrons can release. You can have electrons added. You can have different energy states in an atom. But this is different frequencies that require different quantities of dielectricity to balance it. So the electron is not a particle. The electron is a quantity of dielectricity. And it's a particular quantity required to balance a proton. And that's why we think it's a particle, because it's a fixed quantity. There's only one particular quantity that's going to work, and it's fixed, so we call it an electron. But an electron is not a particle. Electron, and the same with a photon. You see, in here we can have photons. Photon is not, is not a particle. A photon is a particular quantity of light that, that, that is emitted or absorbed by an atom. In other words, in one of the frequencies, the change of energy of these between these three, two frequencies is a particular quantity of energy, and that particular quantity we call a photon. But it's not a particle, it's a particular quantity of energy. So this is how, now, again, the method of how these protons and neutrons get stuck together is, a, a, again, a big discussion, and this is what we've got in physics. We have the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. And it's a big problem, how do we get the neutrons and the protons to stick together? But I put it to you, it's, it is simple. It is simple, it's to do with this coherence and it's still to do with this pattern of the magnetic field. You know, proton and the neutron, again, they've got this game going on. And they'll have a game through the, through the plane of inertia. If you can get the plane of inertia, it could go round and round and round, but it can never get stuck in. If you move it, now it collapses. So there's a particular game that is played with this structure, with this structure. There's a particular game that is played, and this creates all matter. Now, once you've got substances, once you've created a neutron, well, we've got, we've got, the, we've got the pure potentiality, the ether, outside space-time. Now we've got the neutron. Now what we've got is a separation. This is now an independent, independent unit away from the ether. But, it, 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 but the ether is everywhere because it outsmokes side space and time. The ether is infinitesimal but also infinite. So now this neutron is existing in the ether but outside the ether. But it wants to go back. Remember, it wants to go back to the ether. So this can go back if something happens to it, it gets smashed up, it goes back. But it could also get locked into other, 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 it can connect with others and get further locked into matter, into material reality. So the neutron will move to hydrogen, so we've got substances. So now we've got a bit more going on. Hydrogen. And hydrogen, of course, moves into all, all different atoms. Okay, all different atoms. Okay, so now we've got the periodic table. So this is still just substances. But notice they're layers of complexity. Each one is a slightly different layer of complexity. Here's nothing, no complexity, very simple. Now we're getting a little bit more complex, more stuff going on. Now it's even more complex, more stuff going on. So the layers of complexity are in increasing. And even the layers, in layers of complexity are going to be governed by phi. But we'll come to that. Now, the... This then, of course, once you've got substances, well, now you've got, you've got, you've got uh, different states of matter. So you've got plasma. You've got plasma. So plasma is, is where one of these substances or several of these substances are still in the atomic state. They're just free-floating atoms. They haven't locked together. And this is usually high energy because once they've got low energy, it means they've, they've stuck together. They've gone back to inertia. High energy, they're still moving about. They haven't, they haven't gone back to inertia. Then from plasma, you have a gas, gas, and a gas, you have a liquid, liquid, and you have a solid. So again, now you can see how, how the formation of the universe moves into material reality. Now, what's interesting in a solid, even in a solid, so solid, you can have a random solid, all different substances in there going on, and they're just sort of held together in this solid. And they're held together by, of course, well, not of course, but held together by what we're calling gravity and other forces, magnetism as well. But remember, gravity is just another effect of electromagnetism, and, and magnetism is, is really an effect of everything wanting to go back to ether, 
everything wants to return to ether, so it's being attracted to itself to go back. Anyway, so you've got this, and this can also become a crystal. You can also have crystalline. Well, I'll do it as a cube. All right, a cube. So now we've got a crystal. And a crystal is the most stable form of matter. This is where the atoms, the atoms have all locked together. They are trapped in Cartesian reality. They can't go back to ether. They all want to go back to ether, but they've trapped themselves. So this is, the, the, nothing can happen to a crystal. A crystal, if you leave it alone, it's going to stay like that forever. The only way a crystal can be broken down is heat it up or smash it up, grind it up. Something, you, you can break it up, but it will not do it by itself. Matter here has now locked itself in its most stable form. So it, on, on its journey from ether down into solid matter, then this is the final position here, a crystal. And here it's now fixed. Now this is very, very interesting because this now, again, goes back to this one. Here we've got a freestanding, we've got a freestanding unit away from the ether. So this is in the ether, interacting with the ether. And this is the same thing here. This is a crystal, but this crystal, due to coherence, is really acting like a single freestanding unit. It's a bit of matter. This is crystallized ether. This is the same thing. The ether has created a wave, and this wave has, has become a standing wave. So this crystal interacts with ether directly. But it cannot, it cannot go back to ether. It's separate. It's the same as this. This ether can, in, this can interact with it because energy can come to it. So you can think of the ether as light. Light will transmit through the crystal. So we can think of it as like that. So the ether and the neutron, the ether and the crystal, the ether and any of these things interact. There's an interaction between them. But because of what this is, the interaction is limited. So we can have light passing through here. We can also have electricity. You have a thing called piezoelectric, piezoelectricity. It's when you squeeze a crystal, electricity comes out of it. Very, very interesting. So this structure here has still got the ability to squeeze. You can squeeze ether out of this structure. Again, I've got to talk more about this in time. But just for now, think of this as talking about coherence. Everything really is mirroring this. The ether, the non-manifest, and the manifest. Now we've got a third party, a separate unit, that is outside the ether, but is interacting with the ether. But they're still one and the same thing. Remember, this is a standing wave, and this standing wave can be broken, and this thing can go back to the ether. And the ether can create another standing wave. So they're both one and the same thing, but to all intents and purposes, they're two different things. <laughs> a little bit of the yin yang again. We can see how substances, the material realm, gradually builds up through different layers of complexity, but to all intents and purposes, due to coherence, as everything gets together, it just behaves like a single unit in the same way. In the same way. And layers of complexity, so we've gone up to a crystal, so that's, that's a particular layer of complexity. The atoms have worked into a particular balance to form this. But you've also got other layers of complexity. So this is where we're talking about life. You see, life, how is life formed? Well, life, we know, is using this material substance. So it's going to be using atoms, it's going to be using crystals, and it's going to also have a, you know, amorphous matter, like I told you, random matter. All this stuff, and you've got liquid, and you've got gas, all this stuff is used to create life. So our, our body is made up of these things. There's crystals in our body. There's magnetic uh, uh, materials in our body. All this stuff is in our body. But how does it become life? You see, again, it's another layer of complexity. The uh, next layer of complexity is how do you put all these bits and bobs together? So now, you see, the ether creates the neutron. The neutron creates the atom. The atom creates the substance. All right, let's call it a substance. So now we've got the substance. But now what we've got is an interaction between the ether and the substance. So that the, the, this energy can interact and, and do something with this. So we have different substances start to organize. And they organize them in such a way that we, we might have a cell. Here we get a cell now. It's a lot more, there's a lot more before we get a cell. But let's just, just move to a cell. So here we have a cell. 
but you can see the cell is already starting to look a bit like the same thing. It's still looking like the same thing. There's a sort of point of inertia, and this will have a magnetic field in the same way. It will have the same thing. And this will organize itself further and further and further up until we've got a body. So now the body is a very high level layers of complexity. So if you look at this as layers of complexity, this is the secret, layers of complexity. And complexity means information, information. See, information now applied to this separate material substance allows the creation of life. Life, life happens, life happens about here. <laughs> Let's give it a position, all right? So there will be a particular layer of complexity where you could say, ah, now we've got a living system. So pre and, and in life you have different layers. You have very simple life forms, you know, and then you have further and further life forms. You've got fish, blah, 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 leading all the way up to here. And as human beings, we are the highest layer, highest level of complexity is self-awareness. In order to have a self-aware being, a self-aware being, you need a very high level of complexity. And that's the human body. And that's what distinguishes life, layers of complexity. But something has to supply this complexity. There has to be some information that comes from the ether. And that's the, that is the ether interplaying with the material substance. Together, this can create life, a living body. But in this living body, we're going to talk about this in the next lecture, in that lecture the life itself, the consciousness, consciousness itself also behaves in the same way, a bit like this, this um, neutron, this single circle. But it's, it's a, it, it is a singularity of consciousness. And it, the, the trouble is to realize there's something outside physical reality. It's pure potentiality. And how does this pure potentiality, this pure consciousness, manifest reality and once it's manifested reality how does it then interplay with that manifestation because it's created reality but that reality is separate from it and now it wants to play with it so it plays with it by increasing the layers of complexity to create a living thing and this living thing is the ether we are the ether it has gone back to the ether infinity here's infinity it's moving towards infinity because it's moving back towards consciousness here's consciousness and here, where we're human, is consciousness. And the layers of complexity increase, increase, up to, up to here, going up, 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 back to infinity. So this is physics and this is metaphysics. And science is going to be here as well. This will change all the science because this science of coherence is very, very important. This is how you get power. And it's more than, coher more than just that, it's also implosion. Implosion. In other words, you're moving inwards not explosion. You move inwards towards the center. You move towards the point of inertia. You create energy rather than explode it, rather than release it. And resonance is the method. Is resonance and coherence are very similar. Coherence means things working together behave as one. We don't have to think of them as separate things anymore. When all the atoms work together, when the magnet, all the atoms line up in the magnet, they, co they become cohe they, they cohere then it, the magnet itself becomes a single unit, like one atom, all by itself. And then we say with light, when it's a laser, it becomes one energy, one particular frequency coming out all by itself. And resonance is when it's going to be different. So for example, well, wireless power transfers, you have a coil of wire, and it has a certain number of coils, let's say it's got 36 coils, and you have another coil over here, it's got to be the same, 36 coils. Then if you put a current in this one, the current will come out of this one. It's a, it's a distance away. It's because the number of coils is the same, the size is the same, and therefore it transmits, and this is resonance. But there's also coherence. There's also coherence here, because these two are the same thing. They're working together. Now, if you have a different one, you could have a smaller one, but it's got to be in proportion. It's got to be, it's got to be in a certain proportion. So maybe, uh, I don't know the details of it, but maybe you've got 72 coils or something like that. You have to... You have to create some sort of proportion between these that it will allow it to resonate. And it's same like a pyramid. You've got a giant pyramid. We know the pyramids are Giza. Well, again, if you create a small pyramid somewhere, all right, and we've got people, you can buy these now, wear them on your head. This is all good stuff. But the, the, this, if you can get the same proportions as that pyramid, it will resonate with that pyramid. It's the geometry, the proportions, the numbers. 
the numbers are what connect this together. And it's because the numbers are in the chi, the numbers are in the ether, they're outside. The proportions, the, 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 the geometry of this is outside. All you have to do is create a geometry that reflects this in a certain way. They have to reflect each other. And you can have a small one, you know, <laughs> all the same thing. These will all resonate. And even symbolism, you see, symbolism will resonate. It doesn't even have to be that accurate. But this, what I'm showing you here, accurate, accurate resonance is required to actually transmit electricity. But because there is a thing that the chi itself, the ether itself is not unphysical, see, I can do a magic symbol. This is my magic symbol. Okay, I developed this symbol. This is my magic symbol. And there's some resonance to this because to me, this, this connects with the universe being created. Then it, it, it changes direction and goes back the other way. And this is also the golden ratio. This, this, will, be, this will be one, uh, one to five. And there's two points, got a bit of the yin and yang. But this is my own personal magic symbol that I developed some years ago. Anyway, just by drawing that, it's resonating with the concept. It's resonating with an idea. And this movement also resonates with the way the universe works. So it will have a power. It will have an energy, this symbol. But it's not, it's not, no electricity is coming out. It's not generating electricity. But what it is doing, it is, because, it is, it is projecting chi. It is projecting ether. Because it is resonating with something in the ether. It is resonating with information and mathematics. It is, it is resonating with this, this ultimate truth of how the universe appears, what's going on. But that power is, again, it's subjective. You might look at that and feel the energy coming off it. But a scientist will not say, well, that's useless. How am I going to get electricity out of that? But you won't. You won't. But this concept, the concept that this represents will help you get electricity out. Just that directly won't. Now, this is again, let's, let's end this lecture on this final point. You see, this all may sound like crazy nonsense, and if you got this far, well done. But it's not crazy nonsense. What I'm trying to explain to you here is closer to reality. This is reality that I'm sharing with you here. This is hardcore reality. What is nonsense is the science you've been told, the quantum mechanics, the general relativity, the rel all this stuff is nonsense. That is actually a fairy tale. You've been told a fairy tale. Oh, this is matter. Uh, and, and again, they now say a magnet. Where's this force come from? Oh, it's virtual, virtual photons. What do you mean virtual photons? You might as well say, well, there's a little fairy dancing on it, and that fairy is catching it. There are no virtual photons. That, what, that's nonsense. You just Look, we know there's a force. Something is going on. I can feel it. This is a strong old magnet, it's crushing my fingers. But that is a free energy machine. This, if I put this on this side, it's going to fly off. How's it flying off? How's it giving this thing, how is it giving it energy? And it's never giving, it's never stopping. It's permanent energy coming out of here. What are you talking about no free energy? Look at that. So you've been told a fantasy. You've been told the fact there's no free energy is impossible. Look, what's that? <laughs> of course it's free energy. So this is real science. I'm trying to tell you what is reality. Uh, and you have to let go of the fantasy that you've been told. And it's, so this requires a bit of thinking and it requires a bit of, a, a bit of practice. But let, let's end finally with a human body. So again, this is chi. This is the energy. And it's right here, this is the center. Your heart is the point of inertia. The center point of the magnetic field is here in the heart. And this I would say is the seat of the soul. This is the point of inertia. Your soul is here, and the ancient Greeks said that as well. There's your heart chakra. And the Indians would call it the heart chakra in yoga. But that is the point of inertia. At this point, there is no space and time. This is the point of ether. Chi begins here, and from here it bursts out. So you have this outward spiral and you have an inward spiral and you have the magnetic field is then created between these two and due to coherence due to coherence all these layers of complexity in your human body we've got very high level layers of complexity in the human body but due to coherence these all work together as one one single point of inertia in your heart 
one single magnetic field, one single line of inertia, one single plane of inertia, things can move and move around you. And this is the meditation practice you've got to do. And in the Tao practice, they talk about it. They talk about vortex. You visualize a vortex coming down. Visualize a vortex. They spiral the hand. You turn the energy round and around in your stomach 36 times. There's numbers to it. This is all vortexes. You are experiencing the vortex. So do it now for a second. Sit here, hand on your heart. Visualize a vortex coming down from the universe, down through your center line to your heart. And another vortex coming up from the earth, all the way up through your body to your heart. And in the middle, they meet in the center point, right in the middle of your chest cavity. And there you can feel energy emanating and feel that expanding out like a bubble around you. And you can think of it as, as a ball, a sphere. There's a large sphere around your body with your heart at the center. It's going to go above your head. To make it a sphere, it's going to go above your head. You just sit there and feel that, experience that. And build that coherency. And this will build your aura, your magnetic field. This is a protection around you. And inside, if you can focus on this point of inertia, this is the point where the chi emerges, where the energy is manifest. This is what it means by center yourself, return to the point of inertia, infinite potential, the wu chi, inner peace. So this is the experience, and the chi here connecting to the vast universe and the earth, but of course the earth is really material matter, the universe is moving up towards energy, towards light. But the, ultimately, the infinite point is in the middle. Here's the infinitesimal and the infinite. It goes off to infinity, but really that means it's come back again. So we are the universe. The universe emerges from us in the same way, in the same formation. So this is very important. Let's have a look at this one more time. So we draw in the figure of ourselves. This is the body. And this is the center of the body. This is the center between our consciousness, between the ether, and between material reality, between the crystal. It's right in the middle of the body. And this, go, this is the heart center. So this is the heart chakra. This is the heart itself, the sternum, the thymus gland, the center of the chest cavity. And this is the point of inertia. This is the point of inertia. You've got to look back. We're looking back at this one and the same pattern. And then you've got a spiral, a vortex that comes out from this central point. And the vortex goes up, the vortex goes down, it goes up to infinity, and it goes out and down, and from infinity it comes back in again. And this creates the magnetic field. So this is a real thing. So that means your body has got electromagnetism in it. It is made of this energy. It is, it, the information comes from the ether, the energy comes from electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is light, it's electricity. Electricity is a function of electromagnetism. It's when electromagnetism transmits through a substance, then we get electricity. Well, and that substance, of course, can also be air. We've got lightning transmits through air, so we get electricity. Um, but here, here you can see it's one and the same pattern. There's the plane of inertia, energy spinning around. And if you look in the Tao, in Qigong philosophy, and all these mystical sciences, they always have these sort of patterns, these shapes around the body. And it's because it all connects to the one and the same field. Everything is one and the same. And thanks to co coherency, we become a singular object all by ourselves. Thanks to this setup, this structure. So I'm going to be talking more about that in the next lecture. The next lecture, I'm going to be talking about living systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about the universe. I'll sum it up again uh, because I wanted to talk a bit more about gravity, but I'll do that a bit next time. Um, but I hope this all made sense. So do think about this, do try and feel this, practice this in your qigong. So your qigong, you've got several centers, you've got three centers in your body, one in the belly, one in the heart, one in the head. And this is the one I'm talking about, is the one in the heart. It's the midpoint between the belly and the head. And this is the midpoint of your aura, your electromagnetic field, your, well, your magnetic field, the dielectric field. It's the point of inertia, the emptiness, the seat of the soul. Here you go back outside space, outside time. This is where you access the ether. This is where you go into that deep, deep state of meditation. It's an emptiness, a timelessness, a bodilessness. You disappear into the ether. Very advanced meditation. But meditation is not a great word. It doesn't really mean anything. So we'll come to that in time. But we sort of all know the idea of meditation. We're sort of concentrating and focusing our mind and doing something. Uh, so this is what we do, and this is what we do in Qigong. So do check out one of these other videos here, and if you haven't heard that Lecture 1 and Lecture 2, please go back and listen to them. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next time.